Hello, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, which is a program where we bring you guests from around the world. Our guest tonight has put some very serious thought into questions about when humanity begins and how and when it should end. His work shows that the issues of abortion, assisted reproductive technology, assisted suicide, and euthanasia concern a lot more than just questions about an individual. These are all issues that belong to the whole community of the human race. Because we are born helpless and in need of the care of others, we often die in very similar condition, kind of helpless and depending on others. In fact, we depend on the generosity of others for our very existence. Therefore, our humanity needs to be situated firmly in the deliberation of all these issues. We all must think about these questions because they affect each one of us. Now, our guest is a member of the Pontifical Academy for Life. He is also the director of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture at the University of Notre Dame. And he is the author of a book, what it means to be human, the case for the body in public ethics. Now, joining us tonight via Skype from South Bend, Indiana, please welcome Professor O. Carter Sneed. Carter, it's good to see you again. Great to see you. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, yeah, it's great to, to, to be talking to you. And, you know, you are academically uh, and professionally uh, trained in the law as well as in uh, the history and philosophy of science. So you, you know, your goal is to understand science, how it works and such, what it's done in the past, but also to deal with the law, which is the way a society regulates itself. It regulate means to have rules, and laws address the rules that we need to uh, exist in a community of people. So this is a, a very important element. Why are you, as a lawyer and philosopher of science, interested in embryonic research? Well, it's a great question. Um, I'm interested in, in embryonic research because embryonic research, human embryonic research, involves the use and, uh, in some cases, the destruction of living human beings at the earliest stage of their development. The word embryo simply refers to the human organism uh, at a very early stage of development. Everyone in, who can hear us right now and see us, you and I both, were at one point in our lives at the embryonic stage of development in our lives. Uh, it's merely one path on the continuous gapless trajectory from conception through our lives, ending in death, uh, that every human being goes on. And so any kind of research involving human subjects, especially vulnerable human subjects, especially human subjects who can't speak up for themselves, as human embryos can't, is of interest to me because I think that the role of law is to protect persons, to protect human beings, including embryonic human beings, um, and to promote their flourishing. In Something that is worth noting is uh, a number of voices, shall we call them anyway, a number of voices in our culture try to describe the, um, the living creature inside a womb as a blob of organisms, a blob of living organisms. But... It's not a blob uh, by any means, is it? No, no more than you and I are blobs. Yeah. Um, it is an, it's a coordinated aggregation of parts that function in a, in a systematic way 
for the fu- for the flourishing of the whole organism. Yeah. It's a living human being at the earliest stage of development. It's doubt. It's without really no one. Even if you look at any embryo embryology journal, embry- any embryology textbook that that scientists and medical students use, or even high school students use to study, it's clear that we're talking about a living human organism, a, a whole human being, uh, albeit one very small and dependent and physically immature. And in fact, at a much earlier stage than being an embryo, well before the human organism develops into an embryo, right at the very moment of conception, all of the DNA that that person will ever have is present. That happens at conception. That's right. It's a completely new organism from the moment of conception that moves itself along its own developmental trajectory using the genetic and epigenetic resources that it has uh, at its disposal. Of course, it needs, like all of us, needs a hospitable environment to survive. It needs food and and sustenance and, and a safe place to survive. And the first place of belonging for every human being that's ever existed on the planet is uh, in his or her mother's womb. Yep. And, you know, this is is then uh, the starting point for examining uh, ethics. What, what ethical questions arise from dealing with embryos? What are the ethical issues that are most important with an embryo? The most basic question, I think, the most basic principle or concept uh, that is applicable to the question involving the use of embryonic human beings or any human beings is the the principle of justice. Uh, We owe injustice uh, a duty of care to others, certainly not to intentionally harm others and to uh, abstain from those actions that create foreseeable risks to other people. We stand in a certain kind of relationship to one another as members of the human family. Uh, and I think that there is an ethical imperative to protect the vulnerable. And the more vulnerable you are, the more entitled to protection you are. And certain kinds of relationships, like the parent-child relationship especially, carries with it very weighty obligations to care and protect the interests of one's, of one's child. And what we're talking about in embryonic research is the use and destruction of someone's child at the embryonic stage of development. Um, and and that is a, that's an injustice. And that's an injustice that not only is morally troubling, but it's, a just, it's an injustice that the law should have something to say, to say about. The law at bottom exists to protect persons, to human beings, living members of the human family from private violence, for example. Uh, and a, a familiar concept in human subjects research involving you know, human beings at later stages of development, postnatal stages of development, are the concepts of human dignity and informed consent and respect for persons that we can't simply conscript other people into our own projects, projects that might be dangerous or even lethal for them, without um, uh, re- really ever, honestly. Uh, and um, and that's the problem with embryonic stem cell research or embryonic research of other kinds, is that because the living human embryo is, um, you know, until the ni- 1969 had you know was was invisible to the human eye, had not been seen in a in a microscope, had not been observed before, and people say, well, that doesn't look like a human being. Well. That, that is what a human being looks like at that stage of development. And if we rely on our eyes and our own sort of moral imagination that hasn't been cultivated by science and learning, we can be confused and think that it's merely a cluster of cells or merely, you know, a, you know a, some kind of a tissue sample. When in fact, what you're looking at is a living human organism that, that uh, put in the proper environment will, if all things go according to plan, move itself along a trajectory where it becomes very easily recognizable as a living member of the human family. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact, an embryo is extraordinarily complex. It is not a simple organism. It's uh, already moving towards developing a distinct heart, uh, a distinct brain, and eventually limbs um, that will be quite you know, uh, unique, uh, it'll be unique to that that person. Uh, That's the direction that it's going. And even within the, the embryo, each cell is very complex. Uh, And especially since it's a human cell. 
and not uh, a mollusk or a snail or something. You know, these, these are complicated enough, but the human cell uh, is very complicated with a tremendous richness within it. Absolutely, yeah, and, and the sort of the, the powers of regulation and restitution and the capacity to move itself in this direction and modify according to external uh, stimuli, it's, it's quite an extraordinary thing. It's, it's yeah. a miraculous thing. Yeah, yeah. Now, why would somebody want to experiment on an embryo? What are they looking to do with mm -hmm. embryos? And is it necessary for them to kill the em embryo to get what they want from it? Well, the, um, the, one of the most common reasons to, use, to engage in embryo research is simply for exploring different questions of developmental biology to see how these amazingly complex mechanisms of action work uh, in the, develop the development of the living human organism. Um, the more applied uh, investigation relates you know, to IVF, the idea of how to understand and perfect techniques of in vitro fertilization, that is, the creation of living human embryos outside the body that are then transferred to a woman's uterus with the hope of initiating a pregnancy that will uh, result in a live-born child. Uh, patient People who suffer from infertility uh, are, are drawn to in vitro fertilization. Of course, our church has a lot of interesting things to say about IVF and assisted reproduction and explains in a very humanly um, uh, uh, warm and, and thoughtful manner why uh, we Catholics uh, don't pursue those interventions if we're confronted with, with infertility. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, all the rage was embryonic stem cell research, right? The idea was to study the, 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 the cells in the inner cell mass of an embryo or the components in the inner cell mass of an embryo that have the capacity to give rise to all the tissue types in the body in a coordinated way with the hope of either understanding that form of development, but also to develop regenerative therapies. If a person, uh, him or herself, has some kind of deficiency to create a, a line of embryonic stem cells that can be used to create, uh, to repopulate you know, damaged portion organs of the body, like the pancreas in the context of juvenile diabetes. That was a very prominent, and in fact, in some ways, was the hottest question in public bioethics. Uh, when President Bush on August 9, 2001, gave his speech about the role of the federal government in funding embryonic stem cell research or, 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 and what he was not willing to fund and what the kinds of research he was willing to fund. Um, interestingly, uh, over time, in some ways, science has overtaken the, the, the questions associated with embryonic stem cell research, and there have been techniques developed. I'm thinking of induced pluripotent state cells where you can take a skin cell uh, from a grown adult and reprogram it to function like an embryonic stem cell. In, in which case you wouldn't need to use and destroy a living human organism for the sake of studying those questions or for that matter, uh, developing those therapies. Now I should say, embryonic stem cells were derived for the first time in 1998 and to this moment, if I'm not mistaken, there is not a single um, therapy that, has, that is being used anywhere in the world using embryonic stem cells beyond a, a handful of clinical trials. So we were told in 1998 that this was gonna be the silver bullet. People were gonna be able to get up out of their wheelchairs and walk. People were gonna be healed from their diabetes. They were gonna be healed from their, from their Parkinson's. Um, none of that has come to pass, even uh, with over 20 years of, uh, of research in this area. So it's also an important lesson about over-promising in the context of scientific research. It, and one of the things that, uh, and you can please correct me on this, but I've, uh, learn from some researchers that the adult stem cells are more effective ther for therapy than are the embryonic stem cells. Is that correct? I think it's hard to generalize about okay. these things. I think there's, okay. there are some areas in which that may be true. Um, the, uh, there are also some senses in which adult stem cells are more limited than embryonic stem cells and their ultimate capacity to become different tissue types. But this sort of synth this reprogramming of, of adult cells to become embryo embryonic stem cells or to, to act like embryonic stem cells, I think is, 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 appears to be every bit as promising as, as embryonic stem cell research. Be because be it besides the practical issue, that's a practical concern that is not really about ethics. 
about that's exactly what you right. and should do or should not do. That's a very important point. So even if tomorrow, for example, uh, a miracle cure were developed using embryonic stem cells, we would have to we would have to look at that and say, well, that's still an unethical practice to use right. and destroy living human organisms. And even if it's extraordinarily effective and can cure all kinds of dread diseases and injuries, we would have to say that's an unethical pathway, just in the same way that we say it would be unethical to conscript, uh, you know, a, 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 a thousand homeless people to do research on them against their will to produce extraordinary cures. Uh, yeah. We would all recognize that that would be a, a pathway that we can't go down. That that's been done by the government before, with a number of African Americans, uh, back in earlier times. That without their knowledge, they were used for experimentation, and this, uh, and they were con used because they were considered expendable, because they were African American. And yeah, so. this was, as now looked upon, correctly looked upon, as an evil decision. The decision to choose African Americans and experiment on them without their knowledge of what was really going on, without their permission, was, uh, you know, a, an absolutely unethical and you know it moves toward some of the kind it's not quite as bad but almost as bad as the evil types of experimentation done in Nazi concentration camps on unwilling and uninformed uh, uh, prisoners in the concentration camps it has some similar Med uh, medical ethics questions in doing that, and yet we now treat the uh, infants in the womb, the embryos in the womb, the way the African Americans were once treated as expendable creatures who can be experimented on, as, as our guinea pigs. Well, it's interesting. Um, in in the book. The, that you mentioned um, that, that I published last year, I, I have a chapter uh, sort of charting the history of American public bioethics and beginning with some shocking scandals. And the law and policy in bioethics is frequently reactive to these scandals. So one of the scandals that I mentioned uh, was detailed in an article in 1966 by uh, Harvard anesthesiologist Henry Beecher, who, by the way, was motivated by the Nuremberg trials of the doctor, the Nazi doctors who did terrible things to patients in our concentration camp victims. Um, and this was uh, involved the injection of hepatitis into intellectually disabled children in a, a home for such children on, on Staten Island called Willowbrook. Uh, and these children were not, of course, asked if they if their permission to do this. Uh, there would have been no point asking their permission because they're intellectually disabled and they were children. They were not capable of giving consent. So can, the concept of consent was, would not have been sufficient to protect these children's well-being. As you alluded to a moment ago, in the, in the chapter I also talk about the Tuskegee scandal, which yes. happened in Macon County, Alabama, um, and uh, began in, uh, a 40-year experiment, began in the 1930s and, let, and, and ended in the 1970s, uh, where we system, our government, literally our people working for the federal government, uh, for the U.S. Public Health Service, systematically deceived and exploited poor African-American sharecroppers who had syphilis, didn't tell them what they were doing. They would take spinal taps. They would take blood samples. They lied to them repeatedly. It's been reported that they even colluded with local health authorities to prevent them from getting access to health care that would have helped them, including penicillin when it became the standard of care in the 40s. And then even experiments involving uh, children who had just been aborted Outside, who were outside their mother's body and imminently dying because they'd just been aborted and were being uh, the subjects of research that would extend their lives briefly and subject them to even greater suffering. And as you say, there are deep connections between all of these kinds of violations because, first of all, they single, they single out the voiceless and the vulnerable, uh, obviously intellectually disabled children. The African-American sharecroppers were vulnerable because of systematic racism and because of their their socioeconomic circumstances and and certainly they were single all these folks were singled out they would have never dreamed of doing such things 
to wealthy people, to white people, to people who are privileged, people who are able to, to speak up for themselves and have high uh, ranking in society. But here's the interesting thing, Father Mitch. Um, when they were confronted, the American researchers in Tuskegee, and when the, uh, when the doctors at Willowbrook were confronted, and when the doctors uh, doing the horrific research on those newborn babies that had just been aborted who were dying were confronted, they made the same argument that the Nuremberg doctors did. They said, we didn't create these tragic situations. We didn't create these situations of deprivation for these individuals. We're just trying to bring something good out of it by, by studying them uh, and, and trying to, to, to make something good out of something bad. But it only takes a moment's reflection to realize that those people were lying to us and lying to themselves probably because they weren't merely passive observers. They were making these terrible situations the object of their own actions. They were embracing the tragic situations and, and exploiting those situations and extracting from those poor people one more time another round of exploitation for their own benefit. But it was the same argument. The arguments at Nuremberg are the same arguments made in Congress uh, by those who were responsible for those American scandals. In, in each of these cases, the underlying principle is that the end justifies the means. In other words, I have a good intention. I have a good goal, a good purpose. And, you know, maybe I didn't get permission, but a greater good is, is coming from it. And this principle that the end justifies the means is adamantly rejected in Catholic moral thought, that the means must also be inherently just, not only the end, the purpose, but also the way you do things must be just. You can't seek a good purpose in an evil way and then call it morally acceptable, correct? That's right. That's exactly right. And moreover, because every human being from conception to natural death is made in the image and likeness of God. We owe everyone a, a duty of care. Everyone possesses intrinsic equal dignity. And you cannot violate even the least among us, especially the least among us, for the sake of some greater good. Yep, yep. Now, this comes into play, and many people are expressing this in terms of the way the uh, COVID vaccines were tested, that there are differences among the COVID vaccines. Um, they did not use, say, with the Pfizer uh, uh, type of vaccine, they did not use embryonic stem cells to make the vaccine, but they experimented on embryonic stem cells from an abortion years ago, uh, and they used that. And that's even though it happened uh, back in the 70s, I believe, the abortion? Yeah, yeah. And, and they were embryonic germ cells. So they were, they, what you're talking about is a, a cell line. So you, you and I, I'll, I'll explain for your yeah, viewers. Yeah, so please. There, there, was, there was an abortion. Uh, abroad. And, uh, and in fact, there's some interesting questions. There's some dispute about whether or not it was a spontaneous abortion, miscarriage, or whether it was an intentional abortion. And that matters, of course, for our ethical analysis. Right. There's some dis dispute about that. So there was a baby who was, let, we'll just pause it, was unjustly killed in an abortion. And, and so the remains of that baby were then taken by a researcher. And the kidneys of, uh, of that baby were cultured and certain kinds of fetal kidney cells were, were obtained. And using those fetal kidney cells, they created a, a product, a cell, a cell line, by adding certain genetic factors to change, to use those kidney cells, and to create a kind of invention using other kinds of biochemical factors, markers, genetics, and so forth, to create what was called a, a, a cell line, a cellular product called HEK293, OK? And so over time, this cellular product became very widely used and is still to this day very widely used. 
in biomedical research. It's used in, in the production of certain kinds of processed foods. It's ubiquitous, okay? Mm. And, um, and, and this, 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 this cellular product is, is not, that should be clear, it's not the same thing as fetal body parts. There are no fetal body parts in HEK-293 cell lines. It's, a, it's an invention that has been reproduced over successive generations, many, many generations. And, and, they're inter- and these, I, just, I don't mean to be, get into too much complexity, but the question is an old question. When can you benefit from a prior wicked act, right? So there, let's suppose there was a wicked act in the abortion. It's like, can you take the, the remains from a homicide victim and use those remains for some kind of you know, organ transplant or for some kind of scientific biomedical research? Mm-hmm. And the debate as it's unfolded is how do, as Catholics, do we think about the fact that we stand in a chain of causation from what was maybe a, a wicked act, uh, if the baby was aborted uh, intentionally, electively, that was a wicked act. Uh, the conveyance of the baby's remains to the researcher uh, could arguably be a wicked act. How do we think about that? And the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith and other ethicists have said, well, we have all kinds of categories in Catholic moral theology to think about complicity and cooperation. How close is our, are our own actions to the original wickedness? Um, do, do, do we share the same will as the original wrongdoer? And and if it if it turns out to be the case that we are merely benefiting from a prior bad action. We don't share the will of the wrongdoer. We resolve in the future not to to do the same thing again. We resolve to try to uh, uh, mitigate our use of the of the bad, of the fruits of that bad action. Um, we can, for proportionate reasons, use products, and this is in the, in the CDF and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops have said, we can use these vaccines with due regard for the bad thing that happened in the past if there's a grave and proportionate reason. Now, of course, as we all know, people debate about what reasons uh, are sufficient to justify this, what the efficacy of the vaccines, the, the testing in the vaccines. This is a very complicated question that would require a long time for us to talk yeah, about to sort it out. And, and just one thing I'll add, even though the, the USCCB and the, and the CDF and others have said that Catholics can in good conscience use these vaccines uh, for grave and proportionate reasons, they've also been careful to say that we have freedom of conscience and that, and that our conscience, and, that, and if a person wants to bear special witness to the dignity and sanctity of human life by foregoing these vaccines, then they should be free to do so, uh, but with the understanding that they're going to have to take special measures to not infect other people and so on. So that's a that's a very inadequate sort of thumbnail sketch of the of the church's discourse on the question of these of these vaccines. But see, it's it's a maybe thumbnail, but it's far more uh, information than we would get from a lot of the people in the medical side of things that work for the government. You know, we, you know, they don't know how to address those concerns and that people who have these moral and religious uh, objections to use them have a good logical justification for not taking it. There can be a, a, a justifiable way to say, yeah, it can be morally acceptable, but if someone says, no, I still am not convinced, then the church backs that up as a very viable kind of approach towards saying no to the vaccines. Again, as you say, you have to be careful and use other methods to try to prevent uh, getting the disease and certainly passing it on. But uh, there's the ethical questions that everybody can look at. And you just don't get that uh, in the highly political approach that many people take towards the vaccines. Yeah, it's unfortunate in the sense that, I I mean, the public discourse, as I've observed it, is so polarized and people are so... People people are so mean to each other, and I mean, (laughs) on these issues, and they're so disrespectful to each other. we really need to remind ourselves, I think everybody in the conversation needs to remind ourselves that we that we need to be respectful, we need to be thoughtful, we need to attribute goodwill to one another yeah. uh, and, uh, and and really just, you know, take a, take a deep breath and, and let's realize that we're all members of the human family and we owe each other, you know, uh, not just duties of care, but obligations of civility and friendship as well. Yeah. 
this, um, uh, th this is a very lively kind of issue uh, and uh, it affects people on lots of levels. And all of us have to make a commitment to doing justice, which refers to giving everybody their due rights, the obligation to allow everybody their due rights, which in our Declaration of Independence includes the right to life. That is that the very basis of our uh, founding as a nation and that that right to life is not given by the state and therefore the state has no right to take away the right to life. This is something that is given by God himself. Now, we need to take a little bit of a break. So we're going to come back in just a couple of minutes and we may have some questions from folks in our audience. So ask you all to please stay with us. are talking about uh, a book that is entitled What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics. It was written by O. Carter Sneed, and it is available at EWTNRC.com. It is item number 87722, 87722. And um, this is a, a very important set of topics. And um, I'd like us to go to a phone call, if that's all right with you, Carter. Sure, absolutely. All right. So, Thomas? Father. Uh, is this Thomas from Tennessee? It is, Father. All right. This boy comes way up from the northeast corner. Thomas, <laughs> what do you have for us today? Well, you were you just touched upon it before the break, Father. What I was about to ask, and uh, my question is for for Dr. Sneed, and if he could explain uh, the uh, differences in science or the evolution of science since January of 1973, and how that embryo uh, from conception has inalienable rights. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, yeah go yeah. ahead, Carter. Thank you very much, Thomas. Now, it's interesting because, I mean, I think you're, uh, Thomas is alluding to the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, mm -hmm. which we have marked the anniversary of, uh, 1973, January 22nd, I think, 1973, uh, uh, a terrible day, a day in which the Supreme Court arrogated to itself authority that it did not have to impose on the United States an extreme and incoherent and unlawful regime of abortion on demand um, uh, through nine months of pregnancy. Um, and, uh, and then that was reaffirmed uh, in 1992 in some ways in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. And, and the court now has um, just heard a case on December 10th that very well called the Dobbs case out of Mississippi, which very well may be uh, the court's uh, opportunity and an opportunity that I actually expect they will accept to overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey and, and return the question of abortion to the to the political branches of government, which is where it, it lie from 19, 19, before 1973 uh, until uh, up to the, at the very beginning of our nation's founding. And the and, question Thomas asked is about science. I, yeah, can, let me just ahead. end. Yeah. I want to make a, something clear, too. The yeah. Supreme Court did not make a law about abortion, allowing abortion. So the court cannot make law, can it? No. In fact, the role of the, the legislature makes law. The role of the court is to interpret the law. And in this case, 
They were claiming to interpret the Constitution, the document that creates our government, that defines the relationship among the, the different branches to one another, the state and the federal government, as well as the relationship between citizens in the government uh, and persons in the government. And, um, and they, they, it's crazy. They, they read uh, in, a, in a part of the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, which says no person should be deprived of, due pro, pro, uh, uh, deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. They said that language adopted in 1868 when abortion was illegal basically everywhere um, in the United States means that the state cannot do anything to meaningfully protect unborn human beings, that there has to be a right to abortion in that procedural language, which you don't have to be a lawyer to recognize how, how crazy that is. I mean, that's a, just a complete and utter fabrication, a projection onto our founding document, uh, a pernicious idea that only existed in the heads of the justices, and it was nowhere in the text history or tradition of the Constitution. And, and the, what the court, God willing, will do in this Dobbs case is to, to, to write that wrong and to say, in fact, no, the Constitution doesn't prevent us from protecting mothers and babies and families the way they deserve to be protected in law. Um, and in fact, uh, it, was a, it was a mistake of the court, and they're going to correct it. Uh, now, Thomas's question was about was about science. And have there been, I gather he was asking, have there been developments in science that help us to better understand the humanity of the unborn child, which further underscore the error of the court in 1973? Now, I should say, the court knew in 1973 that unborn children were human beings. In fact, Texas made that argument. In fact, many jurisdictions uh, in the United States took that very position. In fact, four months after the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868, the state of Ohio criminalized abortion from conception on the grounds that it was, and I'm quoting the language, child murder, okay? So nobody really thought, I mean, everybody knew in 1973 that the unborn child in the womb was a living human being. However, there have been developments in science since 1973 that further sharpen our understanding, the development of, further development of ultrasound technologies, 4D ultrasound, where you can really literally see the face of the unborn child in the womb, fetal surgery, where uh, surgeons uh, masterfully intervene in in utero procedures, trying to help babies, especially babies with spina bifida and similar kinds of conditions, where they do surgery while the baby's in the womb. Maybe some of you have seen that extraordinary image from uh, Vanderbilt Hospital many years ago with a little hand holding onto the surgeon's finger yeah. as he's, as he's uh, I think the little baby's name is Matthew, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. In any event, but that baby was born much later than that photo was taken. So there are things that have brought into sharp relief our understanding of the unborn child, more so than was the case in 73. But, um, and there's a wonderful amicus brief filed by um, uh, the Catholic Association um, uh, describing, the, the physicians and scientists associated with the Catholic Association, describing all of the data, all the scientific evidence that, that make it really inarguable that these are our living members of the human family in the womb. Uh, and so it's really irrebuttable. No one, unless they're sort of invincibly ignorant, will uh, resist the proposition that as a biological matter, these are living human beings in, in the womb. And so, which is what makes abortion such a, a unique injustice. It's the systematic killing without any lawful protection of, you know, almost a million babies a year in the womb. And people say, well, you know, abortion is one issue among many. Well, it is one issue among many, but there aren't many issues like abortion in the sense where, in the sense that uh, it, it involves the intentional killing and, and, the, and, the, and the effort to maintain a legal regime that prevents the government from protecting uh, the least among us. And something uh, along those lines of further development that's taken place, you know, at this point, uh, doctors can help a child who is born early down to 21 weeks is not right. unusual right now. And no, that child right. can survive. A friend of mine is a neonatologist, uh, Dr. Robin Pierucci, uh, not far from you in Kalamazoo. And she's, uh, she does this, you know, uh, the, these babies survive. She, of course, has to, you know, give them injections and, fo and food intervenes and all this, but she says, anytime I poke at them, they feel the pain and they try to punch me. <laughs> <laughs> of course they do. And of you know, course they that do. they have, and they each have a distinct personality. She can detect, you know, 
different kinds of personalities. They may not talk, but any mom knows that her newborns are not all the same personality. They don't come out as a blank slate. They have differences when they're born, and that's even true at 21 weeks. And that the that's pain they right. feel is very real. The, it's it's excruciating because they don't they don't have the kind they have a, a heightened sensitivity yeah. uh, in their in their in their pain receptors even compared to a, a later uh, child at a later stage of development and that by the way that points up something there's a real corruption in this debate I mean abortion corrupts everything it touches it corrupts the practice of medicine it corrupts legal scholarship it corrupts the law itself it corrupt it corrupts politics and this issue of of pain is a great example of that. There are people who will argue, and, and they'll get their articles published in very prominent peer-reviewed journals, that of course babies can't feel pain until 36 weeks, till 28 weeks to 30 weeks. But you said, I mean, you don't have to be a, a, a Nobel Prize winning scientist to understand that that's obviously proven false when you have a 21-week baby who is experiencing uh, uh, adverse, rea adverse reactions to pain. And it is not like Supreme Court Justice Sotomayor said, the same kind of reaction <laughs> as a dead frog reacts to the frog. nervous system. Yeah. That was patently absurd uh, right. to well, she, say She that. also said that in a, in a different oral argument that hundreds of thousands of children are in critical condition uh, due to the COVID and that's uh, pandemic, true. which is also false. So, I mean, I, I actually, after she said that, I called a couple friends of mine uh, who do palliative medicine and who, who care for the dying and, 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 and see death all the time. So what do you think she was talking about? They said, I literally, I, I have no idea what she could have possibly been referring to. Yeah. The idea that she said something like 40% of all dead, brain dead people, completely brain dead people with a brain stem irreversibly destroyed react in those ways. That, that, that's, that's simply false. Yeah. We have another question. Hello, Elaine. Yes. Hi, where are you calling from? Uh, Ohio. Wonderful, wonderful. What is your question or comment? Well, my question for you and your guests are, what are our patients' rights as far as doctors and medical centers taking our blood without our knowledge through blood work or whatever, and maybe people with cancer who have tumors, what are our rights uh, without us signing anything? They are getting our DNA and using it for research and finding all these diseases or saying they finding all these diseases. And our DNA is from God, and that's my personal data. And I don't feel, you know, somebody should be taking it unless we have authorized it. And also that case from Henrietta Lackey way back, um, how she won her um, case when they were doing research on her, on her blood, and, and was not notified or knew they were doing this. All right. Thank so there's some. Yeah. Let me let me uh, turn that over to you, Carter. What rights do we have uh, uh, in regard to doctors taking blood samples that we give them, but then using it for DNA research that we did not give them permission to do? Right. So uh, the good news is that there are federal rules that uh, declare persons to be human subjects with all the protections that go with human subjects protections. Um, and, and those apply to almost all research. They apply to research that occurs at institutions that are federally funded, uh, even if the research itself is not federally funded. So that captures almost all the research that, that, that uh, of concern here. And that means that if, if they obtain a, a sample of yours that has identifying information about you, that, that makes you a human subject, even though you're not the one that's being uh, experimented on. If they have identifying data, which includes samples like Elaine had mentioned, then that brings that, brings that activity under the ambit of human subject research, and they are required to obtain informed consent for, uh, and, 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 and all the other strictures that the federal rules provide. Now, um, there are famous cases, and Elaine mentioned one of them. There are others as well in which um, 
doctors do tests, do clinical tests on people, not experimental, but for their own health, and they obtain a bunch of tissue. And then they don't tell the patient that they're using this tissue to develop very lucrative uh, lines of cell lines and, in some case, and developing products that might, you know, fetch billions of dollars and make all the researchers very wealthy. And then the, the, the poor guy who gave his tissue uh, doesn't see any of that money and had nothing and didn't know about it. Now, there's a very famous court out of the state, a uh, case out of the state of California called the Moore case versus the Regents of the University of California, which said that if you voluntarily surrender your bodily tissue, you no longer have an interest in, in what's done with it. Now, unless they can obtain identifying information, uh, in which case you're protected by the guidelines that I just mentioned. However, a doctor is has to tell you if he or she has a financial incentive that might compromise their care for you or might change their judgment of what kind of tests to order, how much tissue to take. But um, uh, so, so that would require some informed consent. But I will say, just as a matter of basic practice, for people who are concerned about these things, they should ask their doctors directly about this. They said, what are you going to do with that sample? Uh, and a doctor, if you ask the question, they can't lie to you. They have to tell you the truth about what the, what the plan is for that. You can say directly, are you going to use that for research? Are you going to gather information that's identifiable to me? Are you going to do things with that that I would find unethical? Um, that is, uh, in that case, you would, you would not be simply surrendering your tissue in the way that you'd be throwing it in the trash or giving it to, conveying it to someone and surrendering all of your possessory interest in it. Um, you would, uh, in fact, be engaged in a conversation. So there are protections, but I would say uh, to Elaine and folks who have these concerns, you should be very open and direct with your physicians or your, your uh, you know, phlebotomists or whoever you're dealing with. Say, I want to know what's going to happen with that tissue sample or that blood sample. Will, how, how are you going to guarantee that my private information isn't obtained by other people and used in, in ways that I don't approve of? Yep, good. That, that's, um, so we have that right to ask. We should ask and make sure. We have another caller. Hello, Peggy? Yes. Hi, where are you calling from? Yonkers, New York. Great. And what is your question or comment? Well, I have a question. Since the vaccines save so many lives, and now that using aborted cell lines to make vaccines no longer applies, is refusing vaccine no longer ethical? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, I think you make a very important point about the fact that uh, there is no necessity, in the, in, in, with respect to these vaccines, for ongoing acquisition of fetal remains tissue, OK? That would be a very different situation if, if they had to recharge the cell line by getting more aborted fetal tissue uh, depending on more abortions, depending on more take, unjust taking of human life. That would be a very, very serious situation. That's not the situation we're dealing with right now. And some ethicists, good Catholic ethicists, even argue that, um, that it's okay to use these cell lines because uh, if you didn't use these cell lines, that might create incentives for pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, to create more cell lines, which depend on more abortions. Now, I will say that it is unlawful in this country to uh, to get to 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 um, convey uh, fetal remains to get an abortion and to convey fetal remains uh, in a way to sell fetal remains is illegal. Um, uh, now that's not to say that people don't convey them and and get reimbursed for you know different kinds of expenditures that amount to paying for them. And that's something we should think about and maybe revise our laws in that respect. You may remember years ago there was that hidden camera footage uh, taken by David DeLayden. Of, uh, of a Planned Parenthood clinic where they were, he was basically saying, can you manipulate the abortion procedure to get this kind of tissue sample? That is flatly, I mean, obviously unethical in so many different levels. Um, and uh, even if they weren't selling the tissue, it was deeply unethical. And, and in and, fact, uh, one, one of the respondents did say, look, I want to get uh, a fancy car, I think, like a Maserati. Lamborghini, Lamborghini yeah, Lamborghini. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah. And so, but, but back, back to the question though, um, there are some, and I know there are some bishops and, uh, who have said, listen, um, because there is no, because you can use the vaccine without fear of, of uh, unjust, uh, culpable moral cooperation and the evil of the abortion, if that's, if that's what took place years, uh, decades and decades ago, uh, some of them say there's not really uh, an ethical uh, sort of justification for not taking the vaccine. Um, now, the CDF and others have have talked about, and so I think we separate the question of ethical 
uh, objections on religious grounds from the desire to bear witness to the dignity of human life and to exercise your, your conscientious choice to do that. I think that's been treated as a separate kind of category, a separate kind of good outside the question of, do I get an exemption uh, because I object to the use of these, of these, of these types of products? Um, in, th instead saying something like, I choose not to use this vaccine because I want to bear special witness to the dignity of all human life. And I'm going to accept the responsibility of not taking the vaccine by you know, taking whatever steps are necessary to prevent becoming a vector of transmission yeah. uh, to others. So it, it, it can still be ethical to say, I refuse to do this, and that's justifiable, but because they are no longer doing anything with st uh, embryonic stem cells, it's not part of any production of this, it's, it is ethical to use the vaccines, but neither can you say that you are unethical if you choose not to take it. You can make a moral stance uh, by saying that I don't want to use the, take the vaccines because of my witness to the dignity uh, of life. So the, the, in other words, there's a freedom of choice in this, correct? That's what the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith said. Yep. They said that there is a, uh, and the, 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 the doctrinal office of the Holy See said that people, that people can in conscience abstain from the vaccine to bear special witness. People should have no hesitation People shouldn't feel vexed in their conscience using the vaccine. Uh, they, they, uh, the Holy See said that they encourage people to use the vaccine. The USCCB encourages people to take the vaccine. But they also say that in conscience, people can abstain and follow an alternative pathway mm -hmm. to preventing the spread of the sure. disease if they want to bear special witness. Sure. That's what the USCCB and the CDF have both said. Right. Okay. And so, um, and that's, you know, we're careful moral thinking about these issues is very important. Um, you know, that there, it leaves a kind of freedom of conscience on both sides. And uh, as you said a few moments ago, because there is a freedom of conscience on both sides of taking or not taking, people need to have a respect for the way that they are exercising their conscience. And say, you know, there are some things you have to say, this is inherently evil in all circumstances. In this situation, there's call for respect and perhaps learning from each other, you know, how we can use these things but even the refraining from using, we can have respect for that too as we go forward and not allow the political or politicized panic that media and politicians sometimes try to impose. Um, this is not a case for panic, this, uh, especially at this stage of the pandemic. Um, this would be very important for us to be very respectful at a time when there's not a lot of respect and dignity in the unborn or towards people who disagree with us. Yeah, I agree. We Catholics don't want to recreate within the Catholic family the kind of tribalism and polarization that we see in the, you know, in the more secular spaces yeah. where people consider other people enemies uh, if they don't do react to the pandemic the same way they think that you should react to right. it. Now, again, I just want to mention that your book is called What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics. It is written by our guest, O. Carter Sneed. You can get it at EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 877. Two, two. I want us to get this kind of book so we can think carefully and not knee-jerk react like a politician or a media person, but be are careful in our thought. 
Carter, thank you very much. We've run out of time. May the Lord bless you and all of our viewers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we can bring you Carter and all the other guests and programs we have because the network is brought to you by you. Our mother and uncle was inspired to do it that way. So please keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you and God bless.